So hello everybody, we're here at ACI in London and we've just had a fantastic session where we've been looking at the REVIVE trial. My name's Angela Hoy, I'm an interventional cardiologist based in Hull and we have a great panel, um, so maybe we can introduce ourselves. I'm uh, Rod Stables and I'm from the Liverpool Heart and Chest Hospital. Hi, I'm Sen Devadatana, I'm a cardiologist from Royal Cornwall Hospital. Hi, Anthony Mather. I'm from the Bart's Heart Centre in London. So, thank you. So, we've heard a little bit about the trial design and some of the outcomes. Um, perhaps I can start by asking you, Rod, what are your thoughts in terms of the strengths of the trial and also the flaws with, with the trial? Okay, well, I, I'd probably start off by saying I don't think the trial is flawed in the conventional sense in that I don't think it's got any major defects in methodology, conduct or reporting. I think like all clinical trials, it's always possible to raise debate points and potential limitations. But I would like to say that I think it's a pretty good trial. So let's start off with some strengths on that line. There's no doubt that this represents a really substantial research achievement and I congratulate both the uh, trial leadership team uh, based with Devarker at St Thomas's, the coordinating unit based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine led by Tim Clayton and all the investigators on a fantastic effort. It is the leading trial of its type in this clinical domain. It's published in the New England Journal which is testimony to its quality and rigour and relevance to the population and there's no doubt that it's captured a lot of global attention. So it's, it's a great achievement. It also uh, is British and uh, good for the British community that we've been able to contribute in this way. I think that when it comes to thinking about how it's been received and the way it's been interpreted, the trial unfortunately creates a neutral result. No apparent difference in any of the key outcomes. And that neutral trials are always perceived to be perhaps a little bit disappointing. They don't excite and rev the community up in the belief that practice is about to change and outcomes improve. In this particular case, as well as being neutral, for some people, particularly say interventional cardiologists with a vested interest in PCI, it, it, it's also disappointing. It's disappointing that the kind of thing they do in good faith to patients every day perhaps didn't show such tangible benefits. And it's disappointing because they probably have faith and belief that it has potential for good. So they've been very interested in why the trial didn't work and tried to identify reasons why perhaps it didn't bring the result they'd hoped for. In that respect, there's been a range of potential criticisms. One I think that is perhaps the strongest is that any trial can only res report the results for the population of patients who are actually included. And this trial took many, many years to recruit, uh, over s about six and a half years, in up to 40 centres at the end. And this implies that recruitment was slow and therefore must have been selective. Commentators have noticed that for a trial that seeks to recruit a population with established significant ischemic cardiomyopathy, they questioned whether there was a possibility that some of the LV dysfunction may perhaps not have been ischemic in origin. They note that only about a third of the patients had angina. Only a surprisingly smaller proportion, about a half, actually had a history of an MI. They note that revascularization addressed only about an average median of two lesions, which doesn't seem very extensive revasc. And so they're wondering whether the patients were ischemic enough to have the potential to benefit. Currently, the trial has not reported whether or not the intervention was targeted to viable and ischemic segments, though that information will be coming in sub-studies this year. And so people have said, did we do enough intervention, but also enough intervention in the right place? There have been other comments, perhaps, about was the trial big enough? Was it powered enough? I, I think it was. The original uh, investigators in their index New England Journal publication point out that for all of the key outcome measures, the confidence limits, limits which are a measure of precision, are so tight. I think we can be sure that uh, 
it's not an issue of power. So I've said quite a lot there, so I'll probably pause and let the rest yes. come out in development. So I guess one of the one of the points that I want to try and discuss a little bit further is whether or not there has been a bit of, shall we say, selection bias in the patients that were recruited. So maybe we can just do a poll as to which of you were participating in terms of your centres. Were you recruiting into the study? I know, Rod, your centre was recruiting. And you were not recruiting. You were not recruiting we were. And you were. Okay, so I'd quite like to know what, what say, Anthony, what, what's your perspective as to whether you feel that there was a particular selection of patients that were put forward into the, into the study? Uh, yes and no. I mean, any clinical trial will have that as a uh, potential criticism. I would like to say that I think Revived is probably as good as it gets. It's been very well thought through, planned, um, and yep, the results aren't exactly what the interventional community wants, hence a big discussion about where the flaws. But as Rod said, it's quite hard to sort of find them with the limitations that any clinical trial um, would run into. Our specific patient population all went through an MDT, an MDT in which we did have a broad church of uh, highly invasive colleagues to very conservative colleagues. So I would argue that we were actually quite representative with a balanced view to get into the study. There was a long discussion to make sure we were recruiting the right sort of patient. Yeah, okay. And, and one of the other aspects, I guess, that we also need to discuss is based, I mean, I, I agree with you, Rod, I think actually having an, in inverted commas, negative study published in the New England Journal, I mean, I think that's fantastic. And I think it's a very worthwhile, um, or a, a very, it's very good that we have such a high profile of this type of study. So I guess the next question is, how will this affect your practice? Do you think it's going to change your practice then? I think so. It has already changed the practice since September. Uh, say, if you look through serial MDTs, what we used to do is patient has got a viable myocardium, LV dysfunction, and a significant coronary disease. The intention was, okay, is the patient suitable for PCI or surgical revascularization? So that emphasis on going towards PCI has come down significantly. So in that way, it has changed the practice. And, and what about you, Anthony? I'm thinking particularly with the um, symptom of chest pain, because I think that's one of the key areas that I haven't quite understood at the moment from the revived data, is how much having a symptom of chest pain actually maybe affected what happened to the patients. Um, what, what, what do you think in terms of... I think that's the realm that's left within the MDT. So we've gone from the MDT discussion of we don't know should they be in revived, to the discussion now, we do sort of know and we shouldn't really be re asking them, but what about if they've got chest pain and extrapolating, which is always a bit difficult and dangerous from other studies, suggesting that if there is pain, that is evidence of ischemia and that there's potential symptomatic benefit, which of course revived sort of initially showed in the beginning, but of course medical therapy uh, caught up with the interventional approach. So I think that's the question that MDT should sort of now focus on that is their potential symptomatic, and the symptom being angina, not shortness of breath, um, a benefit to be gained by, by performing REVASC. I mean, one of the, the major outcomes of the trial was really quite high, the mortality rate was. Mm. And, and I think, you know, these are patients in a trial, they get frequent follow-up visits, they can get all of their heart failure medicines optimised. There was a pretty good um, implantation rate for ICDs and CRTs, and yet the the mortality rate was really quite high. Um, were you surprised about that, Rod? I, I'm not really surprised. I think most people have come to accept that patients living with established LV dysfunction have a less favorable prognosis. Uh, on a kind of boring, you know, accountant-like statistical plane, I, I, I am interested how it affects the results because one of the great plays made in the results is that in the medical therapy group, the LV function appears to improve. Of course, this nobody considers that you can only measure the LV function in surviving patients. And, and as a result, when you do the five-year follow-up, all the people who had the poor LVs have already died. So, so there, there are a few little things which you know, catch my attention. When it comes to practice, 
Although these days, of course, if you merely sort of say the words MDT, you feel like you're in the clear. I'm always amazed because in, in a big center like mine, for example, we're doing maybe 2,600 PCIs, 1,400 isolated bypass grafts, 600 other types of bypass grafts. Ask yourself, what proportion of these cases ever come to an MDT? And the answer is vanishingly small. So it's not so much what the MDT thought about the cases where it was discussed, it's about all the people who never got to the MDT. Yeah. And, and I think your, your point about the fact that the change, because the, the change in LV function in the trial is, is relatively modest. I mean, it's really quite small, but as you, as you say, there's, there's a lot of patients that didn't survive. Um, and so I guess um, you've alluded to some of the other sub um, sub-studies that are going to be presented. Do you want to just run through them? And, yeah, and I, I'm, I'm hesitant in that I don't know the absolute detail, but I think we're going to be a lot better informed and we're going to be able to draw better inferences for our practice today and for future trials based on this. But we're going to look, for example, at the relationship between uh, ischemia and viability as assessed by MRI and stress echo uh, a, a, as a function of the outcome based on the strategy. We're going to see more whether or not the revascularization was targeted in the correct zones and whether or not patients who have got perhaps more obvious, more substantial ischemia, which was appropriately revascularized, will derive a benefit. And this may answer some of the questions. So, I mean, I'm going to ask you, Sen, one of, one of my, not really criticisms, but one of my observations, if we go back to, say, the STITCH trial, is that viability was sort of black and white. It was either yes or a no. And obviously, we all know that viability is a grey scale. It's not a yes, no. Um, and so I'm particularly interested in knowing what the viability substudy analysis is going to look like. What, how do you currently assess patients for viability and how does that impact on your decision making? Well, um, with the advent and availability of CMR, it has almost become a gold standard in most centers to go for viability by CMR. Uh, we have a very similar practice, but a very small proportion of our patients, especially if you are going for something else, they go for stress echo, but majority of people will have a CMR by the time they come into uh, our MDT discussion. But something else which caught my attention <coughs> is uh, because the trial was recruited over a long period, six and a half years, so some of the treatments which are currently guideline directed, say for example, sacubitril valset and was not available at the beginning of the trial. So I'm very interested to see when the subsidies, whether they have found any difference at the beginning and end, end with the events, especially mortality, because we are talking about mortality about one third mm -hmm. for the whole cohort. So that could be something important. I mean, one could argue, um, I think that's a very important point. What, going back to the viability, one could argue that maybe we should just stop testing for viability. Is there, is there any point in doing it at all? What, what do you think, Anthony? Absolutely. I think, um, so I stand uh, in the minority, I must say, on our MDTs, but to my reading of the data, every time we try to use viability or some way of targeting, it doesn't come through. And, you know, unfortunately, or fortunately for us, I think the message that came out of ischemia about total revasc and the oculostenotic reflex coming back to us, I, I think was actually quite refreshing for an interventionist to hear. Because in that study, obviously, the targeting using physiology um, and ischemia testing didn't change the outcome and we had that in stitch appreciate the fact they didn't recruit enough patients in stitch to, to do that but we've never really had a strong signal that trying to be clever and using viability works and again you know we have a trial here suggesting that even in viable patients um, revask doesn't change outcome and i think you know for me that the, the take-home message is about the patient population you know the 30 or so percent mortality you know, that, that's shocking and we really need to do something about that. That Revask, I think one day probably will play a role, but we need to target the myocardium and have new therapies that allow the Revask that we do to actually lead to some form of, of meaningful recovery of the myocardium. So although for the current practice, which is purely thinking about the coronary artery, you could argue that Revived has sort of answered that question, just don't think about the artery, there's more to it. I think it, you know, it might come back when there are other clever therapies that target uh, 
what happened to the myocardium and because it will need a blood supply if we can get give it a chance to to recover uh, and again the other shocking bit is that you know that that high morbidity and mortality is in the context of a trial where patients were tightly managed from a heart failure perspective so in the real world i assume those numbers are much higher and that i think is really sad for our patient population and again focuses on the fact that we really need to you know try and find some solutions here no, I think that's a fair point. I mean, one of, one of the other observations I made was that there was a, a, a definite lack of female participants. I don't know whether you, you noticed that as well, but we, you know, the vast majority of patients included into the study were also male. And, and it's another one of those criticisms, yet again, of uh, you know, just trials that we do in, in this field, that, um, that there is a, a tendency towards men being the predominant um, but there, there aren't many men in the trials of childbirth pain relief, for example, true. and that it, to some extent you have to weigh it. Away. It's not. It's not necessarily all um, artificial bias. No, no, no. It might be a reflection of the natural history of the condition. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. D has it changed your practice, Rod? This trial? Uh, pro probably not. In that I am going to await the downstream data before I, ma I can make a better judgment. I also feel that there are certain patients who perhaps have other reasons for revascularization beyond a desire to simply improve their LV function. If you're living with anginal symptoms, your quality of life is going to be affected. That might be an indication on its own. We saw from the quality of life scores, including the generic EQ5D, where it's quite hard to shift an EQ5D. You have to, you have to make a meaningful impact on quality of life. The, the patients managed with PCI enjoyed a meaningful increase in quality of life, certainly over the early phase of the trial, admittedly eroded later. But you know, that might alone be justification for some PCI. I think that's a good point. I think I think we need to not underestimate the value of quality of life, um, and, and particularly these patients. We we the trials clearly demonstrated have this shortened life expectancy. So quality of life is perhaps even more important. Um, and anybody got any final comments? Just congratulations to yeah. the team who provided it, and I think that as a nation we can be simultaneously, you know grateful to the team and, and proud of what they've achieved but also maybe <laughs> as investigators particularly in my own center there's no doubt that we could and should have done better to support this and i hope in the future as a nation we'll rally behind these initiatives oh, i i completely agree I, I think in terms of the uk research community i think we should be very proud that we've undertaken this study and, and it will lead on to to more valuable information coming downstream and, and also potentially um, additional studies in this field. So thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.